the residential market predominantly in the last five years has evolved to very highly price driven has broken down into sub segments like affordable middle premium there are certain cities in residential which have come up very strongly like Lucknow is one good example uh, another good example is Indore another example is if you go down south cities like Chennai you know which is a large city but has you know found its own place uh, cities like Ahmedabad, you know, these cities have become very strong emerging destinations and quite rightfully so. And in residential property market, what we saw again in these five years as a you know, context, tier one cities saw evolution of product concepts. So you, you would see typically standalone buildings, you know, uh, initially pre-2005 especially. This was a phase where you started seeing a lot of township concepts, you know, gated communities coming in with a lot of specs which were, you know, aspirational especially in the metros of the world. In tier two cities, we started seeing the trend of apartments. So, you know, cities like Lucknow, which were never heard of apartments, you know, we started seeing those as well. Cities started expanding very fast. So, you know, there was a period of time that you would say that I don't want to move to say a periphery location. Today, projects are being launched, say five kilometers further from the periphery location. I believe also one interesting thing which happened residential was, this was the same period when income levels have grown significantly average age of buyer has reduced. Uh, 2007, it was about 39 years of age as an average buyer age to buy a house. Today, it's 30 years. So India enjoys that you know, demographic dividend. You also have very strong growth of the middle income group. We are seeing the you know, exact same translation to demand of mid and housing as well. Apart from this, I would say availability of you know, avenues of credit for end buyers, that also increased. You have private sector banks which have launched very interesting schemes post-recession as well. You have fixed rate schemes, non-floater schemes, you know, upsides and downsides uh, kind of schemes you can you know, change to a floating rate. All this has led to a very interesting residential market evolution. In retail market, it was, I would say, a very interesting phase, you know. Pre-2008, the market was very developer-led. So if you launch a mall, you'll have retailers lining up to you and they would occupy space. 2008 onwards, it suddenly turned out to be a retailer-led market. So you started seeing structures instead of lease-based structures of agreements, you know, uh, retailers would say, I would want revenue sharing concepts. Those innovative structures, you know, started happening in retail. The formats kind of, you know, change as well. Uh, earlier it was, you know, a mixed hybrid model as we call of American and Southeast Asian, then Indianized to some extent. This period saw specialized malls. You had, you know, gold uh, shops full of malls, you know, like mall full of gold, and sh gold jewelry and shops. You had hypermarket formats, which were very interesting and the kind of, you know, customer experience that you would get, you know, was very interesting. Also, we saw entry of good, you know, global retail brands into India. So the same period when, you know, single retail brand stores, you know, also saw a huge evolution of its own sorts. High street market, as we call it, the you know the common uh, crore bags of the world, they continue to retain their prominence because rentals always hold up there. This was a time when markets also saw a bit of crash in the retail side. The occupancy levels started falling, you know, post 2008 and 9. Mm. Having said that, of late, what we realized is good quality malls always have occupiers, retailers, investors. The challenge is if you don't plan your retail mall well, that's when you find a challenge. The third asset class is office space. Now, office space, again, has seen its own evolution in the last five to seven years. One major factor that people have realized is, unlike residential, office space is all about post-product uh, delivery service. Mm -hmm. I think that is something we are going to see eventually even in residential, you know, gaining, gaining prominence. But this aspect has already got its prominence in the commercial property market. So, if you're a big occupier and if you want to take a space in one of the big IT parks or an office park, you definitely would want a help desk. You would want complete power backup. When I say complete power backup, it doesn't mean a DG set backup. You would, may want a DPP, a dedicated power plant to you know, give you that kind of solution. You would want concerts beyond work, live, play. That is already given as a norm in B2B segment. So office space saw its own evolution. But what's very interesting in office space is while the markets evolved, the rentals really kind of stuck upon. They never saw the kind of sharp appreciation, barring obviously few exceptions and few periods as well. Uh, we also saw emerging destinations of a space, like Whitefield made it prominence all the more felt. Uh, but Whitefield at the same site saw a lot of challenges on the uh, 
STPI office space property. It saw very strong growth in the IT SEC uh, properties. In Bombay, you saw Nariman Point, you know, prominence was kind of depleting, but BKC's, uh, you know, kind of prominence gaining. In NCR, we saw, you know, Noidas of the world seeing good office space as well, and so did obviously the Gurga office space market. But the important part I'd like to highlight is the rental market. The rentals really didn't see the kind of appreciation which people were generally talking in the pre-2005 scenario. The capital values to some extent in selective micro markets did uh, you know, see appreciation, but the rental market saw lesser appreciation. In selective micro markets, rental markets actually showed performance as well. So yields improved in that, but broadly uh, rental market was not that strong. So that's about the office asset class. See, hospitality, uh, what we realized, you know, is, is you have to break it down into multiple se segments because, you know, it is uh, it's not a cliche asset class within real estate. You know, you have uh, a domestic tourism market, you have a business market, you have a leisure market. So in this entire space, one segment which has come out very strong is the budget segment, especially even on the B2B side. So you have, uh, you know, the concepts like gingers of the world coming up, you know, which provide good quality service, which provide good options, clean rooms, very good amenities, but at the right price point. They don't bring in too much of frills that pens up the price. So those kind of concepts gain prominence. You know, international chains uh, entered in a larger context in India as we speak. I believe that transactions that are happening in you know entire Indian market in the hospitality sector to provide that kind of you know uh, ambience which is available in say European hotels. We're also going to see going forward the newer concepts in the hospitality sector. We would see maybe concepts which are very much prevalent best, which is it's neither a mid-end hospitality uh, hotel nor it's a very high end, somewhere in the right tight spot. You know, it's like a four-star hotel, a three-plus star hotel, but will give you an experience which is very, very phenomenally good at the very right price point. That's what we realize. The intent has become very clear for Indian economy that is going forward, we are very positive about growth. We are growth oriented than being concerned about inflation to, you know, to a very, very higher level. I mean, the growth is now a bigger priority, I believe. I believe to strengthen that, the, the government and the ministry would surely take steps, you know, which would accentuate economic development as well as this sector development. Some of these schemes could be, you know, like allowing, you know, ECBs to be entered in a larger way, more aggressive way in the larger, affordable to mid-end segment, I believe. Obviously with riders, because if you allow ECBs that surely would bring in too much of capital which can be misused and will ultimately you know, build a asset bubble at times, that's quite true. So if you build in riders, that is, if you attract this ECB capital, you as a developer have to launch project in these price points of these typical you know, unit sizes. I believe we would be able to create a lot of capital which could help you know, you know, uh, make you know, these houses cheaper and more affordable for end buyers. The second thing I believe which I think this, this sector you know, desperately needs is to upgrade itself from a sector status to an industry status. I think that if it happens, it's going to get a lot of recognition. I think that's the second step. The third step I believe is What's happened in real estate in India is there's so much of negative connotation to the sector that people believe this asset class is all about speculation and that anybody who invests in this is a greeder. And quite rightfully so that there's a section of people which do that. But there's a larger section of people who are not actually people who have greed in their mind. They're people who actually want to own houses. So what we need to look at is creative financing options for end buyers, especially on the lower income group segment and the EWS segment, how they can buy a. Now, simple microfinance uh, institutions may not be able to really address you know, that need. So I think that could be the third one. And the fourth one is, is, you know, we need to think laterally. When I say laterally as in, look at this industry, you know, look at if you want to buy a house today and if you sell a house before three years, you have to pay a huge capital gains tax, which is called a short term capital gains tax. I'm not a tax expert with that disclaimer, you still have to pay uh, I believe a capital gains tax. Now, if you sell after three years, you still have to pay a long-term capital gains tax, which you can nullify, which I believe after reinvesting. Mm -hmm. Now, I, as much as I understand, the stock markets are logically more speculative than real estate, real estate markets. So I would believe let's bring similar principles in real estate you know, asset classes. Uh, in equities, if you invest for more than years through a mutual funds, you know, it is, it is tax rebated. 
I would say if not bring the same practice in real estate asset classes, at least allow people that if they stay on for three to five years and then they sell that, then they should not have a capital gains tax. Things like that would incentivize and make it more transparent. People would be more forthcoming to disclose their transaction. That vibrancy would remove the black money totally from the system and would make it much more lucrative, you know, both for the tax authorities because every reporting standard would increase as well as for real buyers to take benefit and upside of the India growth story.